Well, good morning. Here we are again. <laughs> Christmas was yesterday. I hope you all had a wonderful and a blessed holiday. It feels like many of you were just here a few days ago. Well, in our Christmas study, we've been in the book of Luke a lot. It's actually one of two places where you find the Christmas story. And we've mentioned a couple of times that our author, Luke, is a doctor. Now, today, typically, doctors write for other doctors, right? Medical journals, papers, most of us, we don't read things written by doctors. However, this story is not a medical dissertation. In fact, the entire book of Luke was written for you. It was written for the average person. It was written for a blue collar worker. It was written for the middle class. It was written for the poor. And today we don't think of doctors as being common people. But back then in the Middle East, especially in Roman culture, doctors often were privately owned slaves. Doctors were a private practice. They were purchased by a wealthy family. And then these slaves were given new names and new identities by their owners. For instance, Luke in Greek actually means nickname. What does that mean? And well, it means he has no name. His name almost implies anonymity, but his name also tells us that he's a Gentile since Luke is a Greek name. Luke says at the very beginning of his story, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus. So right at the very beginning, it sounds like Luke has an audience, right? And this person that he's writing to is called most honorable Theophilus. So right away, scholars have two theories here. One, Theophilus is a Roman official. Perhaps maybe he was somebody at Jesus' trial because most honorable is a Roman greeting. And Luke, throughout this book, seems to be making a case for Jesus' innocence. So he might have written this as a chance to share the gospel with a prominent Roman. The other story or the other idea is that Theophilus is you. Why? Well, because the name Theophilus, it means those who love God. So the name Theophilus could be Luke's way of just saying this book is written for people who love God. In other words, to any person. So the book of Luke starts off very interestingly, written by a man with no name, and written to people who could be anyone. Verse 21 says, When eight days had passed, Jesus' parents circumcised him and gave him the name Jesus. This was the name given to him by the angel before he was conceived. And now normally I don't like to stop at a verse so quickly, but we kind of do have to stop here since this single verse happens only a few weeks before the next verse. When a firstborn son is born, Jewish uh, families would go through several different traditional events. Uh, the first is the naming, second, circumcision. Both of these events have to do with the child's personal identity. Circumcision is tribal, right? It's a tribal identity. It's the marker that this child is Hebrew, that they're a son of Abraham. And then the name of the child is the family identity. Typically, firstborn sons were named after their own father or perhaps somebody great in their family history. Well, Mary and Joseph got to skip all of that. <laughs> the whole, you know, what are we going to name the baby conversation? Because in Luke 1, the angel tells Mary, God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. So the name Jesus to us would sound a lot like Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew is Yahweh, or the Lord, is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. So for Mary and Joseph, naming their child has less to do with family and more to do with destiny. The portion of scripture we're reading today deals with the destiny of Jesus, who this child of Bethlehem is going to grow up to be. Luke 2 verse 22 says, When the time came for their ritual cleansing, in accordance with the law from Moses, 
they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. They offered a sacrifice in keeping with what stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is from Exodus chapter 13. So it indicates that 40 days uh, after the child is born, the parents return to the temple with their firstborn son and they bring two animals with them. They're gonna bring a lamb and a dove. Each animal has a separate meaning, separate tradition. But the Bible says here very subtly that Mary and Joseph are poor as they bring a second bird instead of a lamb. Verse 25 says, a man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So while they're in this crowd, which is huge, it's a temple that's 35 acres, they bump into a man named Simeon, a man whom the Bible says is faithful to the old traditions, but who at the same time is in touch with the Holy Spirit. He was told by the Holy Spirit that he was not going to die until he met the Messiah. Verse 26 says, led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all people. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. And then the Bible says, His father and mother were amazed by what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that a generous opposition, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years, and she was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshiped God and fasting and prayer night and day. She approached at the very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. There's a lot going on here, more so than just this newlywed couple who bring their baby to church, right? And then two seniors both want to hold him. In fact, Luke doesn't even mention what Anna even says, but he still feels that it's important to share. This little story of the trip to the temple is beautiful because what we have here is this physical collision between the way things always were and the way things are going to be. Luke starts by showing us how Mary and Joseph, they observe the Old Testament laws. Luke actually writes the word law nine times in his gospel and four of those times are found right here in these first six verses. Meaning going forward as he writes, Luke will mention the law less and less. In a few weeks, we're all going to celebrate New Year. And of course, there are iconic symbols for that as well. It wasn't too long ago that maybe you might see graphics of Father Time, right? And Baby New Year. The fable is that every single year, Father Time passes the baton on to the next. And through the year, that little baby grows up into an aged old man. In this story of Simeon and Jesus, that's quite literally what we have. This story is a a passing of the baton. It's a changing of the guard. It's this moment, this physical window in time when the Bible shifts from the Old Testament over to the New. Simeon and Anna are symbols of the Old Testament. They're symbols of the Hebrews. The Bible says that Simeon was eagerly anticipating the restoration of Israel. The Bible says Anna began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone, looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Restored means rescued. It means rebuilt. It means reformed. A redemption means that you're being brought back, that you're being made whole, that you're being made new. Simeon was 
an old man, Anna was an old woman, but they both shared a new vision for their people. The Bible says Simeon was waiting eagerly for new. He was waiting for change. Before this day, the idea of Jesus or the idea of a Messiah to him was just a dream. The idea was a prayer. This future king was a promise and everybody was waiting for him. Before Bethlehem's child, faith, having faith meant you were waiting. But also before this moment, the understanding of the Messiah was that it was something only the Hebrews were looking forward to. The Christ was a tribal savior. But that wasn't the vision that Simeon was given. He says to Mary, he says to Joseph, God prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation in the Gentiles and a glory for your people Israel. See, he says Gentiles. It's this very clear indicator, right, that Jesus came for all people, that the Savior is not a localized liberator. Jesus is going to be something bigger than that, something more than that. You see, Jesus didn't come to help people save themselves. He came to be their Savior. Jesus came to do all the work. Bethlehem's child, this king in the straw, was a ransom for the entire world. Now, I mentioned that thing about Joseph and Mary being poor and uh, only bringing two doves instead of a lamb and a dove. And I want to go back to that. So after the purification of the mother, there was the naming and the circumcision. A firstborn son is brought back from God. Now, this only happens with firstborn sons. It doesn't happen with any other child. In Exodus 13, God gives some instructions to the Israelites and there's a few different special occasions. So in verse 13, God says, you should ransom every oldest male among your children. You see, the understanding was since God, long time back, freed the people from the Egyptians, right? God asked for a payment then from every household, meaning that from that day, the Israelites were free, and from that day in the book of Exodus, all the way until this day in the temple, the Hebrews have lived and been raised with this understanding that your firstborn was payment for that ransom. And so what Hebrew parents did is they would bring the lamb as a ransom back for their son. God has never asked for a human sacrifice. So what takes place is something called atonement. The offered lamb takes the place of the firstborn child and that child is restored back to the parents. And it kind of sounds a little backwards and a little barbaric to us, I understand. But at that time, it was done as an observance. The sacrificed animal was prepared, it was eaten, so in truth, the ceremony would look more like a holiday meal to us. But the Bible indicates that Mary and Joseph sacrificed two small birds. That option is given in the scriptures for anyone who can't afford a lamb. So Bible scholars like to point out the fact and say, see, Mary and Joseph are poor. Jesus' roots come from very humble beginnings. And it's true. I mean... They couldn't even afford a cradle, right? Jesus is placed in a manger when he's born. But I, I don't agree. I don't think things that happen in the Bible are done by accident. Mary and Joseph walk into the door of the temple without a lamb. Not because they're poor, but because their son was the lamb. Jesus wasn't like any other son. This Christmas baby was the first child to not need saving because Bethlehem's child came to save. When Jesus was a man, he would later say, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life 
as a ransom for many. This little baby, Jesus, he doesn't need to be ransomed because he's going to grow up and he's going to become the ransom for the entire world. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. In fact, Simeon's song may in fact be the very first Christmas carol. Either when we light the candles here with the Advent and we, we think about that and we think about the arrival of Jesus, we also have to think that Advent is the arrival of the Lamb. It's the arrival of the Lamb of God. This baby, frail and weak, this baby, small and soft, but Simeon still knows that he's holding something so much more than that. He is cradling all the hopes and fears of all the years, right? In this second chapter of the gospel, Luke shows us a man who represents the old law. And he's holding in his arms the new. Years later, a man named Paul would comment on Jesus' role. And he would say in Romans 8, what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of flesh to be an offering. We don't typically talk about the cross at Christmas time. It's not happy. You can't hang decorations on it. But the truth is, the world wasn't waiting for a baby. No, they were waiting for a man. And they were waiting for the man that that baby would grow up into. And perhaps for you, Christmas, maybe it doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. I mean, sure, you have memories and you enjoy the time off, but for the most part, Christmas, it comes and goes and you take the decorations down and life goes back to normal. Let me offer you this. Bethlehem's child is meaningless. Christmas is meaningless unless it means the way it is over. Unless it means hope has come. God told Simeon he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah. The Bible says it was a day that he eagerly anticipated. It was his advent. That sounds a lot like little children going to bed on Christmas Eve, doesn't it? Kids can't fall asleep because they're thinking about presence. This day in the temple, this was Advent for the world. This moment the world was waiting for, the arrival was here. Simeon sweeps the baby up into his arms and he's laughing and he's crying and he's shouting at the same time. And he knows this is God's present and he doesn't have to wait any longer. Christmas says hope has come and the wait is over. You know, what moment comes a really close second to a Christmas morning? The moment when Christmas is over. <laughs> when that last gift is unwrapped and you know, ah, oh, I can relax, right? You made it, you can breathe, you can smile, you can rest the rest of the day. You did it, you made it, we survived. For some of you, life is still in a moment of waiting. Anticipation, your heart is racing, you're nervously pacing, and there never seems to be that moment where you can just relax and let go. That's because there are those of us who still bear the weight of life, always looking to rescue, always looking to be redeemed, always looking to be ransomed and never finding it. Jesus says in Matthew, come to me all who are weary and overburdened and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does Jesus say? Jesus says the wait is over. Christmas says the wait is over. Hope is here. Hope is here. If you need rest for your souls, 
If you need easy, if you feel weary, if you feel burdened, I invite you to receive the greatest Christmas present. Receive Jesus. Seek Him. Follow Him all of your days. May Christmas be your hope. Bethlehem's child is here. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful holiday. We thank you that uh, we just are made it now to the end of the year. It's going to be a new year in a week, and we just look forward to all the new hope, all the new possibilities. Our own Advent has been getting through COVID, getting through all the trials, getting through new burdens and new obstacles that we didn't even know existed. And we come to the end of the year and we are weary and we are strained and we are taxed and we are overburdened and we are stressed. Lord, may Christmas hope relieve us of all of that. May your promise of ransom remove that burden, remove those stresses, and may we walk in the newness of your light each and every day. Lord, your Son is all that matters. The hope he brings, the freedom, the love, the peace he brings is all that matters. May next year be about Jesus, not disease. May next year be about God, not politics. May next year be about the gospel, not drama or stress. Lord, may you shine like Bethlehem's star in the heart of each one, and may each seek out your light and find their Savior. Amen. Hey, that's the end of our Christmas Advent series. We are so excited that you walk through this journey with us. Of course, we're always going to invite you here physically to church. We have two services every single Sunday, one at 930. It's a traditional service. We have a choir, we sing hymns, and we have a coffee and fellowship time in between with donuts. And then we have our second service at 11 o'clock. This is where we also have nursery, we have our children's program, and we have youth. We also have youth group that meets every single Wednesday at six o'clock. So at six o'clock, you can send your kids over on their skateboard. Uh, we have all ages program from middle school all through high school. Uh, they play games and we even feed them at dinner and we'll send them back to you in about an hour and a half. And we'd love to have them come. Hey, we always wanna be the church where you live. Let us know how we can serve you and I'll see you Sunday. Bye.